Melody Beatty, Codependent No More, How to Stop Controlling Others and Start Caring for Yourself. Learn the truth about codependence and how to take responsibility for your life. Codependents are reactionaries. They react and they overreact, but rarely do they make their own choices. They're driven by other people's problems, and in doing so, avoid confronting their own. These reactions are most likely learned in response to stress. For instance, the constant uncertainty of living with an alcoholic. And while these stress reactions can act as a coping mechanism, they'll only hurt you in the long run. That's because, just like alcoholism, codependency is a progressive condition. It doesn't get better on its own. It only gets worse. In this blink of Codependent No More by Melody Beatty, you'll learn some hard truths about the nature of codependence, as well as steps you can take and attitudes you can adopt to begin traveling down a path towards recovery. In time, you'll learn to better cope with your problems, trust yourself, and actually begin to feel your own feelings instead of someone else's. Chapter 1. Codependence stems from taking responsibility for others. To recover, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. Jessica was married to an alcoholic. Though the warning signs came early, like when he stayed out drinking all night on their honeymoon, Jessica was in denial about her husband's condition. Until it got so bad, she could no longer deny it. Eventually, her husband got sober, but Jessica was still angry. She wondered why was she the one responsible for all the housework, lawn work, and keeping their whole life on track. Jessica's friends offered to take her to Al-Anon, an offshoot group of Alcoholics Anonymous geared towards the family members of alcoholics. But this made Jessica angrier. Why did she have to do more work when he was the one who caused all the problems? Why did she need help when he was the one who caused all the problems? Jessica felt unappreciated, unheard, and unloved. Sometimes, Jessica felt like she was going crazy. She wasn't. She was just a codependent. And alcoholism, being a family illness, had wreaked havoc on her life. Unfortunately, like alcoholism, codependence is progressive. That is, once you pick up the habit, it tends to get worse. And to be free of it, you must take action. In Jessica's case, it didn't matter that her husband caused the issue. It was her problem now and her responsibility to solve. The word codependence can be traced back to the 1970s when it was thrown around in the treatment center community. It referred to someone whose life was negatively affected by their relationship with a chemically dependent person. Codependency was a coping mechanism developed in reaction to someone's substance abuse. Since then, clinicians have learned that codependence isn't linked to substance abuse. Other compulsive disorders such as overeating, gambling, and sex addiction affect family members as well. Likewise, codependency was seen in the family members of the mentally or chronically ill, as well as people in caretaking professions, such as nurses and social workers. The author offers a more inclusive definition. A codependent allows another's behavior to affect them, and in turn becomes fixated on controlling that person. This definition is important because it points the way to recovery, which is not by changing the other person, but by changing ourselves. To recover from codependency, we first have to recognize how much we've let other people's behavior affect us, turning us into obsessive, controlling caretakers with bottomed-out self-worth and an overabundance of anger. It's also important to point out that all these behaviors don't make us defective. They're simply unhealthy stress reactions which were necessary to mentally and emotionally survive. However, over time, these same stress responses have become self-destructive. And now, it's time to take responsibility for ourselves and take our lives back. 
Chapter 2. Detachment from the problem person in our lives gives us clarity about our own needs. Taking responsibility for ourselves can sound rather daunting, but keep in mind it doesn't have to happen all at once. It's a -a day-at-a-time process, and once you get started on it, can be quite exciting. Because when we take steps toward recovery, we feel an instant burst of freedom. We start by learning detachment. In order to begin healing, feeling our feelings, and giving ourselves what we need, we must first begin by detaching from the problem person in our lives. What does this mean? Well, if attachment means being constantly preoccupied and worried about someone else's problems, then detachment is the opposite. So if attachment means reacting to others' problems, we detach by taking care of our own needs. If attachment means emotional dependence, we strive to get to know our own emotions. And if attachment means caretaking, rescuing, and enabling, again, we let people handle their own problems and put the focus back on ourselves. Detachment isn't meant to be cold or hostile. It's not a withdrawal from life, nor is it a meek acceptance of all the bullshit that comes our way. And it's not some forced zen-like avoidant bliss. We can detach and still love and care and be warm. That's because detachment is based on the idea that we're all responsible for ourselves. And since we can't solve someone else's problem, worrying about it won't help either. If our loved one has created a catastrophe in their life, whether a drunk driving arrest or failing to write a college paper, we let them handle the consequences. In doing so, we give them the opportunity to learn and grow, and we show ourselves that we can do the same. And though it may be scary to just let these things happen, it's healthier than trying to control everything. Through detachment, we gradually learn how to accept reality. And best of all, our faith deepens, both in ourselves and in fate or God or destiny or whatever you want to call it. When we cease grasping for control, we're freed from the burden of worrying about things that aren't our business and we see that the world actually keeps on spinning. The best thing about detachment is that when we're freed from the perpetual anxiety of worrying about others, our minds are clearer and we make better choices about how we love and care for those closest to us. We make better decisions. We hurt ourselves less. And in turn, we experience serenity. We give love that isn't manipulative. And we start living our lives free of guilt. Chapter 3. Instead of being reactionary, learn how to detach and act with purpose. Maria was also married to an alcoholic, and she tried to control her husband's drinking by always being present. Still, he found ways to drink. One day, they got in a fight, and he said the reason he drank was because there wasn't enough money. So Maria got a job. Things actually improved then. Maria was respected at work, and she enjoyed the new freedom it gave her. But then her husband drank again. Maria's anxiety came back, and she immediately quit her job to be closer to her husband and keep things under control. But was she actually controlling anything? Or was his alcoholism controlling her? When we try to control that which is none of our business, we're the ones who end up controlled. We also stop acting in our best interests and, over time, just become frustrated and crazy trying to control the impossible. Whether we're dealing with someone else's alcoholism, food, or gambling, or sex compulsion, we're fighting a battle we can't win. Their disease is stronger than our will, and no matter how much control we exert, it's all just an illusion. When we can't even control our emotional reactions, How can we continue fooling ourselves that we can control others? And even if we could control their actions, we still have no agency over their feelings, thoughts, or beliefs. One of the most common ways we try to control is by rescuing or caretaking, the way Maria did with her husband. Rescuing is taking on responsibility for someone else's thoughts, feelings, or actions. 
However, in our daily lives, it's often not as extreme as what Maria went through. Perhaps we say yes when we mean no. Or we clean up someone's mess when they can easily do it themselves. We speak for others, think for others, feel for others. We give too much and accept too little. And though we think we're being loving, rescuing is actually disrespectful. It assumes that the person we're rescuing is incompetent, unable to help themselves, a victim we need to save. So what do we do? We try to detach by not overreacting. Codependence, filled with anxiety and fear, tend to overreact to events around them. But when we react, we don't stop to check our feelings and lose our chance to consider our best response. And the reality is that few things in life are really that urgent. While feelings and thoughts are important, they're still just fleeting little things. Actions matter, of course, but in the day-to-day, they won't stop the world. So learn to catch yourself before reacting. Watch out for feelings of anxiety or outrage, rejection or self-pity, shame or worry. It's okay to feel these things, but what are you going to do about them? Instead of reacting, step back, get peaceful. Take a walk, meditate, relax. Get some clarity on the situation. Instead of thinking in terms of solving the problem, think instead how you could take care of yourself. Chapter 4. We Combat Our Low Self-Worth by Learning How to Love Ourselves When the author started learning detachment, she was forced to take responsibility for herself. That's when she realized that other people weren't the reason her life was a mess. She was just using them as an excuse to avoid her own problems. Which is why, over and over, Beatty reminds us that the path to recovery, sanity, and happiness starts by minding our own business and taking care of ourselves. In other words, self-care. Taking on an attitude of self-care means being loving toward ourselves. We start by taking responsibility for our lives, not just the day-to-day problems, but also all our spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. While there may be a steep learning curve at first, meeting these needs will be a fulfilling and rewarding journey. First, we rid ourselves of the false notion that our needs aren't important. Even if no one else seems to care, they matter to us, and we owe it to ourselves to respect that. While in the past, our needs were never going to get met, it's now our responsibility to meet them. And as Beatty constantly reminds us, when the going gets tough, we can always ask, what do I need to do to take care of myself? Beatty recounts how one day she received a call from a fellow Al-Anon member. This woman wanted to leave her husband, but was afraid that she wouldn't be able to take care of herself. She felt this way even though she had a job, took care of the kids, and did all the chores. Beatty states that the fear of being able to take care of ourselves is one of the most common refrains she's heard from codependents. That's because beneath the surface, most codependents are filled with fear, like little children desperate for affection. Worse yet, this little child inside us doesn't believe that we're worthy of love because it's spent its life being abandoned, abused, let down, and rejected. So in order to fight low self-worth, we must try to nurture that inner child instead. When we turn the focus from others to ourselves, we give respect to that inner child, we give it attention, we give it love. We begin to validate ourselves instead of seeking approval from others. In time, we learn how to trust ourselves. So start by loving and accepting yourself as you are, right now, and cherishing all your quirks and imperfections. By doing so, you'll start to feel your inner power grow as you embrace your feelings rather than running from them. Chapter 5. Though it can be frightening, learn how to feel your feelings. When Beatty got sober, after 10 years of alcohol, cocaine, and heroin abuse, 
Her counselors told her that to stay sober, she'd have to face her feelings. An incredibly scary proposition at the time. But in doing so, Beatty learned that feelings are not facts, as the old AA saying goes. For many codependents, this is difficult territory. Beatty recounts how when she was leading family support groups, she'd ask the members what they were feeling. They'd respond by saying what their loved ones were feeling. No matter the question, her patients would talk about someone else. Because after years of focusing on the other people in their lives, they had no clue what they themselves were feeling. As codependents, we often refuse to feel because it hurts too much. And over time, we've learned that being emotionally vulnerable only leads to getting hurt. Sometimes your emotions can get so big and dark that it feels like all you are is emotion. And this can keep you from doing the scary things necessary to make your life better. Whether this is caused by the family systems you grew up in or the partners you ended up with, acknowledging your feelings can be frightening. Because in doing so, you have to admit something has to change. But while feelings may bring sadness, they're also the main source of joy. When we suppress the negative stuff, it makes it impossible to feel the good stuff as well. And when you allow yourself to feel, you can discover great truths about yourself, your real desires, your goals, your wants and needs. However, you may need help along the way. And for codependents, the 12-step program Al-Anon uses is one of the greatest support systems out there. 12-step programs aren't just about sobriety. They take broken people and teach them how to put their lives back together and how to move forward. But to get results, you have to work with the program. This means going to meetings and listening to other anonymous members share their experiences, strengths, or hopes. There's no membership role, no sign-up sheets, no fees. Nothing to do but come and listen. And of course, share your own experience, but only if you want to. For many people, these meetings are a revelation. Because it's the first time you can actually hear your own experience coming out of someone else's mouth. And hearing this allows us to slowly come out of our shells and finally be our true selves. It helps us face our problems, because finally, we're no longer alone. After a while, you begin to learn how the steps work, and during the day, you're able to consider how to apply them to your own life. And when trouble pops up, it's always possible to call another Al-Anon member for advice. Over time, the steps become both habits and a way of life. They teach you how to problem-solve and deal with emotional disturbances and how to handle the roadblocks in life with grace and serenity. Twelve-step programs are simple, and that's precisely why they work. But there's also a magic that happens there. On paper, all this stuff may seem hokey. But by going to meetings and working the program, a serenity sets in. Our lives change. We change. Slowly and on the universe's time. The problems don't get solved all at once. But they do get solved exactly when the time is right. And the more we surrender to the program, the happier, healthier, fuller our lives can become. You've just listened to our Blink to Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. The most important thing to take away from all this is that we are each responsible for ourselves. You didn't cause your loved one's problems, and therefore you can't fix them. But you can fix your own by taking responsibility for your life, your emotions, and your healing path. In this Blink, you've learned some basic truths about yourself as well as some basic tools you can start with. But remember, recovery is sort of like learning the piano. It requires patience, practice, and time. So take it one day at a time, and don't be afraid to ask for help. And here's some more actionable advice. The easiest way to ask for help is to find a 12-step group. A quick internet search is sure to bring up a list of meetings in your area. Try searching for Al-Anon, Adult Children of Alcoholics, or Codependence Anonymous. 
though it may be a little scary, these meetings are filled with people just like you. They know what you're going through, and they can help. Thanks so much for listening. And if you can, please leave us a rating. You can find the Rate It button on your screen right now. We always appreciate your feedback. See you in the next Blink.